Well, thank you, Mavis, for taking part in this interview for our newly launched Cardiff Centre of Law and Society. Um, I want to ask you some questions about your research career and the future of socio-legal studies, I suppose. And perhaps we need to start with some context and some background. So I wonder, I'm interested that you actually studied history as your first degree. And you then got a master's, I think, in social policy um, from the LSE. Mm -hmm. How did you get into socio-legal studies, and particularly socio-legal studies in relation to family law? Well, um, as part of, I think my, my thesis for my master's was on disabled people and access to services. At a time, a sort of austerity mark one under Mrs Thatcher when things were getting very difficult and I began to notice that all our teaching about identifying needs and developing policies to, to meet them were going by the board and it was time to look for something tougher and it occurred to me that a legal claim has rather more power behind it than a social need so I became interested in doing research for the Disablement Income Group, where Donald Harris was uh, also a member. And he told me more and more about this exciting new centre that was going to be set up in Oxford, socio-legal studies, bringing together social policy people, lawyers, um, a psychologist, and a couple of economists, and said, would I be interested in um, taking that further? As a social policy? As, as a social policy person, yes, yes. And the, the first project which the centre did was, of course, on um, personal injury, uh, yeah. compensation yeah. for accidents. So the disability background was relevant. Right, right, I see. And so did you meet Johnny Kalar quite soon when you no, started No, no. We, we did the, the big project on disability and... Uh, services for disabled people and all of that was more my interest in the actual legal claim side. Uh, having done all of that, uh, suddenly Don Harris, who is such a wise man, said, would you like to meet my, my colleague John Nicola, who's very interested in family law and the position of women after divorce, and uh, off we went. So 40 years on, yeah. we're just starting our next project. Right. Oh, well, we'll get to that in due course, I hope. Um, it's been such a productive um, partnership. Um, just one other point about background, I suppose. You did subsequently take a law degree, didn't you? A long time mm. later, mm. yes. Why was that? I'll tell you exactly <laughs> why. <laughs> By that time, I was uh, spending a day or two a week uh, inside what is now the Ministry of Justice, what was then the Lord Chancellor's Department. And I was helping with the development of the uh, child support legislation. And it involved many meetings with Lord Mackay, then Lord Chancellor, who again was just a lovely man. Um, and he was actually very good at looking at graphs and numbers and so on. He was a mathematician. Um, but some legal question arose about housing, and he said, I can't do the accent, but he said, well, Mavis, you won't understand that because you're not a lawyer. <laughs> and I thought, right, I will jolly well become a lawyer. Mm. And um, did an Excel, not Excel, um, London Metropolitan. Okay. Um, right. Part-time that an evening? law degree. Yes, it was. And they were so unbelievably nice to part-time students. You would ring up the library, say which book you wanted to read, and they would ring you back and say which seat they had put the book on, open at the page which you <laughs> had said you wanted to read. The thing was to make things easy and possible for um, hard-pressed working students. Interesting. And my best friends there were a policeman who had worked on um, the Broadhurst estate. Um, do you remember the riots and mm. awful troubles mm. there? Very interesting man. And I asked him why he was doing a law degree. And he said, so that I can argue with my superiors. I thought, good for you. Mm. Mm. <laughs> so. 
apart from being able to respond to Lord Mackay um, yes. on, on legal issues, what, what do you think doing that degree has kind of given you in terms of your well, research? It, it didn't give me any family law because they wouldn't let me take the family law course, which I was rather cross about because I rather wanted to um, tidy up some odds and ends. <laughs> but I've been so spoiled uh, working all these years with John Ekela, who is a superb family lawyer. Yes. So he's always at my elbow and I'm rather... You've had a full to, tutorial, of course. I've had full tutorials, yeah. yes, and, and help. Right. But what it did teach me to do, when, when, when the um, child support legislation was going through Parliament, uh, I'd often get a phone call in the morning saying, I need three arguments by 12 o'clock uh, as to why we shouldn't do this or should do that. And I thought, you know, do my best. And I remember one morning, this, this was working with Peter Harris, who was the you know, responsible for all of this. And I said, I've got two arguments, but the third one contradicts one of the other ones. And he said, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. I said, what do you mean it doesn't matter? <laughs> if the arguments are contradictory, how's that going to help you? And he said, it's like throwing snowballs at a window. You just carry on until the glass breaks, OK? So I'm OK, sorry. <laughs> and I thought, how do these lawyers think? I really want to understand um, the way arguments are put together. And as a social scientist, which I was by then, you, you're always in the position of saying, well, maybe this, maybe that, little trend, maybe not. Oh, they would say that, wouldn't they? Uh, and it's not binary. It's not mm. within the law or without the law. Uh, and it was just to help me see how lawyers think. But I am not uh, intellectually a lawyer in any way. So you, you cleave to your humanities and social sciences. So. Right, yeah. OK. Yeah. And it used to horrify me when we had... Um, doctoral students arriving at the Social Legal Centre uh, from law who would arrive and say, they were planning to do some empirical research, but they would say, my research is going to prove this because they're lawyers and that you prove a case. And I would struggle to explain that when you set out to do some empirical work, you're not trying to prove X, you're trying to ask a question and see what you find and see what that leads you to think. And that's a real ongoing Dilemma, I think. Right. Well, let's look at some of the questions that, that you've asked in, in your research career. And I suppose your contribution to sociolegal family studies has really fallen into two quite distinct parts. Um, that's how I see them anyway. Um, you started, I think, looking at financial support obligations between spouses, cohabitants, parents towards their children. Um, and then more recently, you've been exploring different parts of the family justice system. Um, I think you've described your key findings um, that, for example, the economic problems after divorce yeah. have more to do with parent, uh, parenting and partnering. Yeah and that child support is difficult if people are on low incomes but have more than one family. Um, you've said that such findings are really no-brainers um, in a way, but I mean, I'm sure they're not no-brainers. And I wondered if you could reflect on what impact you think those kinds of findings might have had either on the development of your critiques of policy or on policy itself? Well, I, th I think um, when we first looked at the economic consequences of divorce, financial consequences of divorce, um, there was a big row going on with the men saying that they were being made to keep these women for the rest of their lives and women weren't doing a stroke of work and that, that was unfair. And at the same time, there were clearly a lot of um, lone parents who had been married and were either separated or divorced, who were struggling, who were on benefits. So there was a, uh, a bit of a, uh, an issue about which side was uh, uh, in the right or in the majority. So we just did a quite careful look at how money changes hands after divorce. And as, as, as you said, we found that there was only... 
uh, a, a maintenance, ongoing periodical payment where there were children. If there were no children, then this just didn't happen. Um, and in those days, it was more common for the woman to stay in the former matrimonial home, partly because income support would pay the mortgage interest payments, which now they don't. Yeah. So that's changed the housing position a lot. Um, <clears throat> I, think, I think what we try to do is just, you know, bust a few myths. That, you know, there is no population of women doing very nicely out of um, low-income men. You know, what, <laughs> most of the people who divorce are on average or below average incomes. They have children. Uh, men very often go on and have another family, and one average or below average income can't actually feed two families. And at the time, we were quite uh, pragmatic about it in policy terms. I don't remember the Delaney case where the judge said, stop, of course this man can't be expected to send money back to his first family. He's keeping this family. And basically the state picks up the tab for the pe people he doesn't want to live with and uh, has higher expectations of his ability to provide for the people he has chosen to live with. So that's how it was until Mrs Thatcher appeared and reversed the polarity and said men must uh, accept their responsibilities, not have another family unless they can afford it and so on and so on, which of course uh, was a bit um, optimistic. But that really was the motivation, not so much uh, trying to save um, the, the welfare budget. And I think, um, so I think what we did in, in that setting um, was to increase the knowledge base on which policy was being made. I was at a seminar um, given by an Australian uh, coming over to tell us about the new child support arrangements there. And you know when you ask a question, you say who you are, and she said, oh, can I talk to you afterwards? I said, yes, love to. You know. I never got to talk to her because um, the man from the ministry tapped me on the shoulder on the way out and said, could, could, you, could you give us a hand? <laughs> You seem to know about these things. <laughs> and at the time, he was being asked to brief on the new child support arrangements in Australia and in America. And he, the only way he could do it was to contact the agency in Washington and ask them to find somebody to write him a paper on what was happening in America. Whereas for me, the, the two people working most on it, Irv Garfinkel and uh, his group, I mean, they're... they're friends I've known for years, I've worked with. So all I do is fax them all. In those days, we're just beginning to email them. And I get a full, totally reliable answer within the hour. And it doesn't cost anything. Right. Whereupon, the Lord <laughs> Chancellor's Department said, oh, you know, maybe this research is quite useful. <clears throat> so I think we did make sure that they didn't do what quite often happens in policy terms, that somebody misunderstands what's happening somewhere else and thinks we'll do that and yes. cherry picks. And um, we did manage to convince them that uh, you couldn't um, relate this to the tax system as they did in Australia because um, our tax assessments are pay as you go and so on and so on. So um, I think it, it, it helped in terms of increasing understanding of what they were doing. Um, and from you know my own personal uh, perspective, it I, you know I then began to work more and more there. And every time there was a family law initiative underway, as far as I could see, it was usually going to be a disaster. And so, <laughs> sorry, I didn't want to be skipping ahead, but <laughs> what what tended to happen was that um, with, with the, the knowledge base that you have as an academic and the ease of talking to people in other jurisdictions, uh, meant that you could point out the elephant traps and hopefully uh, induce a little caution. They would then come back and say, well, what should we do then? Whereupon I would be completely stumped and I, I don't know, I'm not a, a policy creator. I'm just a sort of voice of doom saying, please don't make it worse. <laughs> I know that child support has been described as a blunder. Um, it's one of the examples of government yes. blunders. Yes. Um, but 
I think you've also said that it did have an impact on people's attitudes yeah. towards paying uh, yeah. child maintenance. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm slightly puzzled by that because I don't see a major shift in terms of the amount of money that gets paid for children or the proportion of non-resident parents who are paying. So I wonder why, why you feel that. Well, I think there were some huge blunders in the way it was set up. It was a, a, a joint enterprise between Lord Chancellor's Department, Lord Chancellor introduced it in the Lords, and um, then the Department of Health and Social Security and because social security systems are all based on very precise actual reports of your current income, your current housing costs and so on, it, you know, sort of enormous amount of detail yes. and uh, the attempts to collect that amount of detailed information, information about actual housing costs from a couple who've just split up and he may be staying with friends, moving here, moving there, you know, it's just hopeless. Yeah and leads to increased um, lack of trust and so on. But I think with our input, we managed to accomplish um, the pulling together of all children and all their parents, because in the past, these kinds of maintenance payments were only for the children of divorcing parents, parents who had married, increasing population of cohabitants separating. This was all fathers and all children and I think that was a massive step forward. I'm proud of that. Mm. And also, um, there was always a fuss about the other partners, uh, the ex-partners, new partners' income, right. and terrible sort of balancing acts going on. And I think we, we, we did move towards a much cleaner, clearer account of people's incomings and expenses. Um, and um, the, the mothers, um, work-related expenses were taken into account. Yeah. Things like that, which were, I think, a, a big step forward. Um, and at the time, um, it was awful. I mean, it's the only time in my life I've had rotten eggs thrown at me. I had police protection for a while, not that it did much good, because the only time I actually ran the, this very special number, I got a um, recorded <laughs> message saying, I'm sorry, there's no one here to take your call at the moment. Please call back later. I thought, well, you might be a bit late by then. <laughs> who, who was... Um, uh, Fathers for Justice. Right. But I think what, what I have seen is, I, th I think this, this step change away from only supporting children and married parents who separate towards supporting all children, regardless of right. the civil status of their parents has absolutely stuck. That's, that's absolutely not questioned. It always surprises me. Um, and the other thing that's happened, I've been uh, over the last couple of years sitting in on a number of uh, early meetings between um, lawyers and clients talking about um, financial arrangements. I've also been sitting through uh, a number of mediations talking about children matters and financial matters. And what happens now is that um, it sounds sexist to say the men, but it usually is the men who are, uh, who are going to be involved, uh, will come in with a piece of paper saying, I've looked on the website and this is what I should pay for my children and uh, that's what I'm going to do, and then talk about other things. It's, it's there. Yeah. Yeah. And that absolutely wasn't there. In, yeah. in 1990, you would sort of squeeze as much money as you could from the, <laughs> the one who had more to the household with less, usually the one where the children were, and you'd do it in terms of, you, you'd, um, well, the, the, you, you'd try to load the money <clears throat> on, onto um, a, 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 an order for children if you thought she was about to ma remarry, if you thought she would never remarry and the children were about to reach independence, you'd load it onto her. <clears throat> and you'd have orders for wife and family, or, yeah. you know, there was no clear yeah. money for children in that identified way. And um, I think that that really has made a difference. Right. So I think, you know, the, the, the underlying principles were much more um, constructive than was, was understood at the time in all the annoyance and mm. distress of trying to, 
trying to make a, a social security system handle a dispute. Yes. I remember them coming to me and saying, what, what furniture do you think we should need in the room when they're having these assessments? And I just said, you know, something that doesn't show the blood on the carpet. And they just looked at me as if I was mad. They hadn't seen it as a dispute in, in that sense. And I was, I'm sure you know they, some of these disputes are fairly, fairly grim. Yes. I remember um, sitting as a child, on a child support tribunal mm. and... Um, trying to kind of move, as you say, from a social security mode of yeah. thinking to a dispute resolution was, was yeah. not at all easy. It wasn't yeah. comfortable, was it? Yeah. 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 So that moves us on, I suppose, to dispute resolution and very much the work that you've been doing with, with Johnny Clark since, I suppose, the millennium, the turn of the, mm. the century, um, focusing on the different professionals Yes. in the family justice system yeah. um, and you started with solicitors yeah. you then moved on to barristers judges and most recently um, mediators yeah. Um, yeah so I wonder if you we could it's such a fascinating group of studies I wonder if we could start by asking you what the motivation was for going into mm. that mm. kind of, of research well again it all comes back to my sort of uh, schizophrenic existence, <laughs> um, sitting in Oxford and also sitting in Whitehall. I, I, I went in as um, an advisor on child support and then uh, as the interest in research grew, um, we did move towards setting up a research function within the Lord Chancellor's Department. They'd never had one before. Um, they'd been just, you know, lawyers in stripy trousers. But when they took over the court service, they became a big organisation and they began to set up data collection systems and began to want to know what the rest of the world had to say. And the research secretariat was set up with one civil servant working three days a week and one administrator working, a sim I think perhaps she was full time, and me a couple of days. And that was it. Mm -hmm. Um, but we had, um, I think we did pretty well in getting a lot of very good work commissioned. There was no micromanagement because we couldn't, <laughs> didn't, didn't want to anyway. Uh, and the whole thing was synchronised with the academic year in that um, I would go round to all the policy heads and say, what's, what's on your desk, what's worrying you? Not just in family, across the board. They would say, Ooh, you know, this is coming up. And I could often say, oh, I know someone who's just done something on that. Or we would um, put these areas of interest uh, out to all members of the Social Legal Studies Association and other yeah. networks yeah. and ask for expressions of interest. I mean, one paragraph, not a, a major uh, commitment of time. And people would write in saying, well, I've just done something on this. I could do a bit more. Or you could see what I've done or I would like to do. Uh, and then we would take these back to the policy chiefs who sat in the single committee and they would um, prioritise, they would say, they would fight amongst themselves about who was going to get their piece of work done. And it wasn't a bad way of doing business. And then we could quickly commission, quickly. Um, but so, but so I, I began to have enormous respect for these um, officials and was quite surprised by the level of hostility towards the legal profession, which I would hear day by day. Uh, it was just from the officials? From, uh, it, it emanates from ministers. Right. But it's part of the, you know, oh God, lawyer, you know, the lawyers would do that, wouldn't they? Um, and uh, the legal profession, having for years been asked to become more businesslike and organised, when it did become a bit more businesslike and organised, was seen as, you know, money grasping and profiteering, and particularly with regard to uh, legal aid for family matters, you know, public money on private quarrels. And of course, there was an escalation in the divorce rate, so the bill was going up. It wasn't necessarily cost per case, but the actual volume of cases was increasing rapidly. So there was this huge um, attitude of distrust, um, which I think I understand better now, having been involved with the Department of Health when I worked on the Bristol Inquiry. Mm -hmm. And it was just the same. The Department of Health 
loads of doctors, blame them for everything. Um, <laughs> I had some dealings with education where we all know what they think of teachers. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's structural because in comes a young minister, junior minister, and they want to keep their job or get a better one. How do you do that? You convince Downing Street that you can save money, do good, and increase the, the ratings. So ideas of how to do that are quite rare, or at least sensible ones are quite rare. Mad ones are to a penny, and somebody will collar a minister at somewhere or other and you know, insert some insane scheme into their minds. And then it's the job of the civil servants to investigate the feasibility and desirability of mm. where income's research is quite handy. You can pull things back a bit. Uh, but this endless, endless lawyer bashing suddenly coincided with one of these new ideas, um, mediation, family mediation, which was, of course, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful way of working. You know, the, the notion that a neutral person facilitates a conversation between two people in, who are trying to work out their arrangements are, and are in dispute and helps them to, to move forward without going near lawyers and courts and without escalating problems and so on and so on. And uh, when it began, it was sort of pioneered by people who were very excited by it, very committed to it, and were volunteers. They weren't being paid for this. Um, and, and still, the, the, the bulk of the, um, the, the sort of traditional mediation population is made up of retired people who are really good people wanting to help, uh, but not looking for a career, not looking for a, a huge income. It's a, it's, it's a, a different, it's, yes. it's a volunteering activity. And very often they worked in lawyers' offices. The lawyers would give them office space and so there were no overheads. So here is something which looks wonderful. It's helping people to not be cross with each other, helping them to make sensible arrangements. And it doesn't cost anything. <laughs> <laughs> Whoopee! <laughs> so it, government went for it, sort of hook, line, and sinker. Um, and uh, uh, in order to do that, somehow uh, what went with it was a campaign of sort of denigrating family lawyers, particularly solicitors at the time. So I, mean, I was quite bemused by this because having taught lots of young lawyers and kept in touch with them, seen them working their socks off for very little remuneration. If you worked as a family a family lawyer and did predominantly legal aid work, you didn't make lots of money. You worked your socks off. You had to wait months to be paid for anything that you did get paid for. You always did far more than you got paid for, as far as I could see from the people I knew. So uh, we thought it was important to go and have a look. and. Um, Having done big surveys on the financial aspects of divorce, we were in sort of survey mode. So we did do a, a, a survey of uh, basically what tasks were being addressed and what skills were being used. Um, and in the course of that, I, I became more and more curious about the, 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 the detail of what was happening. It's quite hard to encapsulate all of that in a... Uh, uh, an hour's interview or uh, mm. even with follow-up um, postal surveys. So I, I was invited in to sit with them. I would yeah. go and sit with a, a sister for a week and just note down what happened. Um, and it was rather different from what I think um, the department thought happened. These people were, they were giving information early on, which can quite often limit a dispute if you're expectations are realistic. Then they were giving advice. Uh, is what usually the client wants is, to, is, what should I do? What do most people do? What, what's, what's fair? What's sensible? And if you get some sort of feel for what that is from your lawyer, and then you want help in getting there. And these, um, particularly the legal aid people, they were doing so much. They were organising meetings with the local authorities to sort out rent arrears. They were staving off the electricity company from shutting off the electricity. They were giving home phone numbers to people where there was domestic violence. You know, it, was, it felt like um, a, a GP or a, yes. um, a social worker. You know, this, you're my client, 
I'm helping you. Um, and absolutely no appetite for going to court. If they had to go to court, they regarded that as a failure. And certainly didn't want to have to hang around courts waiting for things to happen. So it was just so different from the um, stereotype that was being used. And then, um, it, so when, when I went back to LCD with all this, they said, oh, it must be the barristers then. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I see, uh, yes, yes, oh, I right, see how sorry. you went on from one to Silly me. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so went off and spent time with the family bar. And exactly the same um, settlement culture, mm -hmm. but things move a bit faster because uh, you're, you've exhausted the number of yeah. possibilities by the time you get there. And again, I was staggered by um, the the effort that's put in over and above a legal aid contracted mm -hmm. amount of work, mm -hmm. particularly in um, care work. Um, a lot of young family viruses cut their teeth on child protection cases. So you've got these young public school chaps in their mid-twenties with a client, you know, a, a Glaswegian addict with five children who is absolutely certain she's going to take them home with her at the end of the day. And he knows very well she isn't. Meeting her, becoming her, her person, her champion, um, going through the day gently, 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 pointing out how things may not go as she wishes. And then when the axe falls at the end of the day, in what James Mundy refers to as the nearest thing we have to capital punishment, when you take a mother's children away, yeah. or a father's children away, um, sitting for hours afterwards, um, supporting, explaining, saying, you know, giving some self-esteem, saying you did the best you could, uh, but it's not going to work. And, um, so again, um, uh, there, was, there was some impressive work going on. There were also one or two crooks, but... <laughs> we'll gloss over those. Yeah. We'll gloss over those. <laughs> and then, of course, well, it had to all be the fault of the courts. <laughs> so uh, I ended up sitting with judges in, in the lower courts. and I wasn't interested in the finer legal points. I was interested in how people get to be there and, and how it feels and who's doing what. And um, again, um, the amount of activity promoting settlement was yeah. the dominant uh, activity. We di I did actually do a sort of stopwatch on the judges I sat with and timed what they spent doing what. Um, and I think we came out with 7% of their time was spent adjudicating. Mm -hmm. Uh, they, they will, and district judges will bend over backwards to encourage people to reach their own decisions you know, with, with the help of their legal advisors uh, where they have them. Yeah. Yeah. But they don't always. Um, one case I really remember was um, a terribly good district judge who had been a solicitor, knew his patch, knew house prices, school catchment areas, the lot, um, was in court on, alone at eight o'clock in the morning, so I was there too because I was the shadow, um, putting the tape in the machine to record when, when cases happen. No usher, no clerk, no nothing. Mm -hmm. And at one point, there was a woman asking for her older child not to go and live with her hippie ex husband just till he'd finished his GCSE. She said, Just one more year with me, get him some exams because he and his dad they'll have a lovely time but I know what'll happen <laughs> and she'd got a new baby with a new partner who was uh, not there and, and so there's there's her the baby me and the judge in court and the baby starts to cry so I spend the morning <laughs> walking up and down the back of the court patting the baby on the back and and the judge you know they he says I, I the, the the father hadn't shown up for this hearing it says I, I'm sorry I really do have to see him and talk to him but I, I do very much understand what you say, and um, don't worry. We'll give him one more chance to show up, and if he doesn't, then I will make an order. So, escalating disputes? No. <laughs> Putting children first? Yes. And how expensive is it for one person to spend um, an hour uh, at most? on this. You know, everything's typed up and done by him before he leaves the room. There, there is no 
tribe of backroom officials um, slaving away. And the fact, the other thing, I become obsessed with the minutiae of people's lives. <laughs> and all judges have their own loo. And this is not because they're grand and important, it's in case they inadvertently overhear something that they shouldn't. And I think that's said it all. It does. <laughs> or nearly all. <laughs> we'll remember that. <laughs> Your most recent... So that's how I got there. But then the, right, me, you know, the mediators, right. yes. What, what I wanted to ask you, I mean, mm. the, the subtitle of your book, Lawyers and Mediators, mm. is The Brave New World of Services for Separating Families. But of course, it's quite a, a hard, uh, difficult yeah. world. Yeah. And yeah. What, what, I, what I wanted to ask you, actually, was not so much what, what you, you found, um, but where socio-legal researchers mm. go mm. in this brave new world yeah. um, to conduct research to move the story forward? Yeah. How, yeah. how are we going to find people yeah. and yeah. deal with what's happening to them, do you think? To, to help them or to research them? To research them yeah. initially, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, well, I, I won't talk about the mediation findings, but I, I was quite... Um, taken aback by the range of activity um, and uh, I was also surprised to find how many mediators are actually lawyers right. and are practicing solicitors but because of the changes to legal aid they can't work for the kind of people they worked for in the past in the same way uh, but We've got ourselves into this really peculiar situation where you have two people in the room, the, the, the parties with the difficulty, um, who are desperate for advice. Mm -hmm. And you have um, a, a qualified solicitor sitting there working as a mediator who is forbidden to give them any. Um, and given that government is trying to save money, this seems to be slightly silly position we've got ourselves into. And do you think that there is any responsibility for that to be laid at the door of the professionals, the practitioners? I think... For not being flexible enough in how they work? I think the, the development of mediation as a new profession is almost a, a, a faith as much as a profession. The people who first developed it are so committed to it and... Um, you know, various slightly different ways of um, carrying out mediation have developed and there are terrible um, arguments between the different branches. So everybody clings very strongly to their view, which is that the mediator is a, a neutral, working with a couple in dispute in the room. They don't do anything outside the room. There are not follow-up letters or phone calls or meetings with other experts or... It, it's here and now, um, and they are to give information, but not to give advice. And that's not an easy line to draw. Uh, John Ekela had this lovely sentence about, if, if you saw a notice saying dangerous snakes, poisonous snakes, if it was attached to a glass cage in a zoo, it would be information. If it was pinned to a, a, the gate of a field you're about to walk into, you'd be very silly not to construe it as advice. <laughs> and I think that says it all. That and the muddle about what's a problem and what's a dispute. The, the lawyers see themselves as problem solvers, whereas mediation is essentially a dispute resolution. And people don't always have a dispute. At least they don't know what they're arguing about until they started to make their plans. So if you don't allow information plus advice at an early stage, you're actually missing a chance to prevent some disputes or at least to minimise some disputes. So I, I do think it's, it's very unfortunate the way that it's, it, it's, it's become so rigidly yeah. defined. But on the other hand, government takes must share the responsibility for being, having become so critical of lawyers that they won't have anything to do with them. So provided they call themselves mediators and don't give any legal advice, <laughs> it, it's just, we, we, I think we've got to move towards uh, a position where one lawyer can give information to two clients at once and where uh, there's a lovely Dutch scheme um, where qualified 
specialist family lawyers, fully trained as mediators, offer the couple what they need, what they choose. You, you can begin with mediation. If it doesn't work, you can have legal advice separately um, and you just, just be more flexible. Uh, because as it is, um, in uh, children mediation cases, I worry because the child is outside the Protection of the Children Act. You know, mediation is private ordering. Yes. And what um, the mediation seeks to achieve is, is agreement. Yeah. And the child is essentially a third party, and it's very hard to deal with a third party in, in the mediation context. Um, if, if people choose to go that path um, in, in the private market, that's one thing. But if government is going to pay for one service only, and it's one which um, doesn't guarantee children protection of the Children Act, that worries me a lot. Uh, it's all very well talking about the voice of the child, but the best interests of the child are yeah. seriously important. The voice of a, as most of these children are under, well under five, yeah. it's not really enough, I don't think. And in finance, um, mediators generally advise people to check out any agreement that they're considering yes. with a lawyer. Yeah. So you're paying twice. Yeah. <laughs> it, yeah. it, we've just got ourselves in a muddle, and I just hope we can improve matters. But meantime, um, all these other forms of help are, are springing up, um, most of which is unregulated. Mm. Um, You're talking about the internet and services well, available. Well, the websites through. vary enormously. I mm. mean, some are actually incredibly good. And a, lo a lot of people can uh, prefer to be um, in private control of their own affairs and take things at their own pace. And if you're young, computer savvy, um, especially if you don't have children, um, you, can, you can do it, fine. But if you're uh, not computer literate, a lot of older people, more older people are divorcing now, um, more people have English language issues, um, it's not enough for, for everybody at, at all. Uh, and I think, um, you know, there's a wonderful scheme in Holland called the Rectvisor, yeah. uh, which is supposed to be a pathway through um, many aspects, but divorce. And I think there's a feeling here that if we just did that, we'd be fine. I think what they don't appreciate is that the, the Rechtweiser costs 10 times more than the Dutch thought it would. Um, that <laughs> people, a lot of people use it in a sense they tune in for an hour and get information, but they then don't follow through. You can't ever test evidence or question anything. Um, and also there is a, you know, a full legal aid system in Holland anyway for you to turn to if you need it. So it's, it's a slightly dangerous... It's, yeah. it's one of those, you know, cherry plucking. It's interesting. Issues. It's interesting that you talk about Holland. Um, you've also mentioned Australia mm. and mm. the United States, and of course, the other side of your work has been very much in contributing to a sort of an international socio legal yeah. studies movement. Um, and I wondered if we could we could sort of look at that. One mm. of the things that interests me, I suppose, is whether there's a distinct Anglo-Saxon or um, English-speaking world mm. style of doing socio-legal studies mm. as compared with what you might find in continental mm. European civil law systems. Have you come that's across a, that's that a good at question. all? I mean, the reason I got into comparative work was because there was no money here. We couldn't do big surveys anymore. So you used to contact your friends elsewhere and say, got any interesting data we can play with? Yeah. That's, that's how it began. Right. And I just find um, working in an international context, it just enables you to see your own situation more clearly. Uh, the first time I ever went to Poland, there was a they were agonizing about how to get their divorce rate up just while we were freaking out about how to get it down. Because in, in Poland, Catholic country, you know, Catholicism was equated with anti um, communist regime, um, house, acute housing shortage. And so, um, uh, and a lot of men drank a lot of vodka and got quite stroppy. And so what um, 
everybody wanted was for some of these women to stand up and say no and get out of there. Um, but they didn't. So and it just taught me never to take anything for granted, just always go and look and see. And that's very much the Polish Petrozitsky tradition. I, th- I think sometimes we think of um, European activity is much more theoretical, much more sociology of law, less sociological studies. And I think the, I think the sociologists in France are very much more um, dominant in sociological activity than lawyers. You don't find lawyers dabbling in empirical work as you do here, right. which can often be quite disastrous. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah. um, so I, I think in, in, in continental Europe, there's more sociology right. in the mix. Yeah. Um, but if you think of um, Canada or Australia, they're terribly like us, except in Australia they always seem to have more money to spend on right. research yeah. than we do. Yeah. Well, they, they yeah. use the, the Australian Institute of Family Studies uses the solicitor's interest on the solicitor's um, client accounts, doesn't it? Client accounts or Does it? Yes, you know, the money that's what deposited in solicitor's firms oh, attracts a levy which pays for... What a wonderful idea. Wonderful, absolutely. <laughs> and in Canada, they're just incredibly sensible. Uh, but, but I suppose it's, it's, it is more complicated than one might hope or, mm. or, or suppose because there can be quite <clears throat> basic misunderstandings yeah. in terminology. So, for example... Yeah all the arguments about shared parenting. Yes. I find it takes a while to clarify what one means by shared custody, shared care, shared parenting. And I wonder how far you feel that um, the kind of organizations like Onyati Mm. um, and and so on Mm. can can be used to kind of get over those sort of problems yeah. of, of interpretation. It's hugely important. Um, as you say, with the whole shared parenting issue, we, we got we led into that after looking at parental obligations in financial terms. Yeah. So it's the two well, it's sort of two sides of the same issue. And uh, you know, shared custody it was always a horrible, misleading term. Mm. Legal custody which you know, everybody here has always had and always will have um, yeah. parental responsibility. We don't talk about rights. I think yeah. rights is the other uh, tripwire. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you would find, you know, we were talking about shared custody and some people would be talking about um, a child living one yes, week with one parent custody. and one week with the other physical yeah. custody uh, and other countries are just talking about... Yeah. Um, um, and I suppose the, the other status. the other danger of borrowing from abroad without due mm. care mm. and attention mm. is that um, things don't transplant. No. No. Um, how, how do you think socio legal researchers can can help? You you talked once about or you've described some socio legal research as, as acting as a sandbag mm. to <laughs> to deflect mm. um, crazy ideas yeah. from from taking root. Can yeah. you can you say a little bit more? Yes, about well, that? I can give you a very clear example. Um, when the Norgrove Review mm. of um, Family Justice was being set up, um, there was. I was quite involved, and they were setting the terms of reference. It was all beginning to happen. And it was terribly clear to me that there was going to be some unfortunate um, international cherry-picking, if we weren't very careful. Uh, Everybody was convinced that in France, um, family law, family justice is inquisitorial. It's not adversarial. And it's just not true. It's, it's the criminal justice which is inquisitorial, and, and all civil justice, including family, is um, adversarial, which sounds nasty, sounds like fighting, but it actually means that the parties have more control, in that they both go and say what they want to say, and they can test what the other one is 
saying, whereas if you're being inquisitorial, it's the magistrate who decides what's going to be considered and will simply exclude things which you, as a, uh, a party, might think are, you know, desperately important. Uh, like the fact that your wife is mad, or <laughs> little things like that. Um, so I, with great trepidation, said, I kept saying this to, to colleagues, they would say, yes, I keep telling them, but they don't yeah. I said, well, would it help if we got people from the relevant jurisdictions round the table just for a day, day and a half, and um, you know, senior officials, ministers, if they like, can come and actually hear it from the horse's mouth. They don't have to rely on shifty academics like me trying to push a particular line. You know, talk to the people who know. And we did. We had people from France, Spain, Australia, Canada, um, Netherlands, I think, Scotland, um, all the places where they were doing, Germany particularly, which has really interesting family law system, justice system, which we don't uh, know enough about, I think. Mm. And, and for a day and a half, um, MOJ, to my amazement, flew them over, put them up in nice hotels, took them all out to dinner, sat and listened to them and asked some questions. And what we did, uh, we, I did structure it in that we, um, we, we identified sort of, I think, three, maybe four issues, which are the most common ones which come up in the family court. Um, and we then asked each country to say exactly, not what the law was, yeah. not what the policy was, but what would actually happen. Um, the Scandinavians, of course, I forgot. Um, to say what would happen in these cases and people's jaws were dropping. Uh, <laughs> family courts, we don't have family courts in Sweden. What do you need those for? You know, we have social services. <laughs> um, and this, this, this went on. And then we asked them what they thought was particularly good about their own system, what they would recommend for the people. And um, took it from there. And it was uh, terrific. And afterwards, um, they let me make it into a special issue of the Journal of Social Welfare and Family Law. So it's actually on record. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. So it, it, you know, you can... So I suppose uh, that's an example of impact. And yes, I have to ask yes, you, as a, as a yes. British academic, oh, yes. we're all obsessed impact, with yes. um, the requirement yeah. to produce non-academic yep. um, impact. Yep. What I mean, you've you've had considerable experience of this because yeah. of all the work that you've done, and I know you mentioned um, families need fathers um, a, mm. a, a while back. Mm. Yeah. How does one get one's work into the public domain mm -hmm. in front of the right people mm -hmm. without overly running the risk of either being seen as a sort of, you know, Ministry of Justice stooge mm, mm, mm. or being trolled by, mm, by people mm, on the mm, internet. Mm. Well, I've How experienced you... both <laughs> quite, <laughs> quite frequently. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, I, I was in an odd position because I was, um, you know, helping set up this research function which they hadn't had so they did need me and and I you know got to know people well and they're, they're my good friends so there's no issue there I don't think uh, they could see I, I was never paid for any of this it wasn't there was nothing in it for me except the satisfaction of making sure that they were aware of good research that they needed to know about but uh, since you asked this is another way we do it <laughs> this is the shared parenting um a briefing paper, and this was as a result of another uh, sad but eventually very happy event. There used to be a group called Family Policy Studies Centre, yeah. which was an independent group which collected information on a, uh, a social policy current issue, put it together in a, in a, you know, this is sort of eight pages, I think. There it is. It's, everything's referenced. You can follow it up. There is no um, comment. Um, other than to say this is what the issue is and this is what information is available. And these um, was, were circulated. The, the foundation was eventually supported by Bearings Bank. And when Bearings crashed, yeah, the they crashed. So Caridwin Roberts, the very wonderful director, came uh, and joined us in Oxford. And we carried on producing these papers. And 
Uh, I think they've actually been quite helpful. Mm. It's got a price on it, but nobody didn't sort of, they do get, they do get handed out. Um, Nuffield has been very generous. And you can put them in people's hands. You can have websites and have things where people go and find information. But it's, if you actually, if I just say, look, you know, this might, yeah. and people will take it away and then they'll look at it on the train or whatever. Yeah. And I remember the minister going into the Lords, Cathy Ashton, the day we were looking at the, it was the 2006 um, presumption of contact debate. And it wasn't this one, it was the one before. And she got, she got this in her hand. I was walking behind her and she dropped all her papers. And completely, oh. But this, the red one, she Put said, on give me that one, she says. <laughs> it, no, because you can see it, you can find it, you know what's in it. You can. So I think... And, and this, um, so all MPs would get it, all judges would get it, um, people from other jurisdictions get it. Um, so I think that's one way of mm. doing business. And that, I suppose, brings us neatly to thinking about um, one final aspect. Um, you originally worked at the Socio-Legal Studies Centre in Oxford. Yes. Um, you been involved a lot at Oniati, but you've mm. also you co-founded Oxflap, yes. Um, yes. the Oxford Centre for Family Law and Policy. Yes. Yes. And I just wondered if you had any useful messages or lessons for us at Cardiff in launching oh. our centre or for other institutions mm. that are trying to do something similar. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think this is such an exciting venture and, and the, the launch conference which has just happened has been such a success it's been I th I don't think you can, you're going to put a foot wrong I think yeah. you know the, the emphasis has been entirely on the meeting of minds the the discussion the interest the sharing of information it hasn't been on oh what a grand center we are with fancy notepaper and fancy websites and there's I think one thing we did in Oxford we had no money we just had some rooms uh, and I had a job and Johnny Clark had a job and anybody else who had got any money um, or didn't need any money mm. and wanted to come and work with us came it's simple as that so it's sort of minimal administrative right. overload right. Uh, once you've got a huge administrative structure you've got to feed it and then you find yourself desperately searching for money to pay for mm. things which aren't close to your heart or your primary function. Mm -hmm. And I think I would go for keeping all of that side of things as, as minimal as possible and with all the IT you can much more easily. And keep an open door and keep inviting people in. Make friends, keep them on side, keep them talking to you. Right. And you'll, you, you build up a community. I mean, that's what has happened in Anyati, isn't it? Mm. And people talk to each other, and that's what people have been doing here. They haven't been presenting and um, making a book. They've been talking to each other, sharing ideas, moving on. It's been terrific, and I think that's what I'd go for. Great, thank you. I'm, I'm sure we'll 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 take that on board. And I suppose the the last question really is um, whether you're optimistic or pessimistic. Yeah about the future for socio-legal <laughs> studies in the current Oh, socio-legal studies? I thought you meant the state of the world. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I don't want to ask uh, you that. <laughs> oh, I think, um, I think we're embedded in the policy-making process here. Uh, reduced resources have meant that it's probably less apparent, but it isn't less true. Uh, and in fact, um, academic research is needed more and more as governments are less able to fund their own. Um, I think the worldwide community of scholars and the level of communication is also a huge sort of oxygen supply. Um, and we're all, it's funny how we're all finding ourselves moving in the same direction. We're all, uh, it, it, it's not a static discipline, that's what gives one huge confidence. It's moving, changing, developing. We're not talking about access to justice. We're talking about what is justice? And do you have to have access to a lawyer to have access to justice? I'm not sure. What is a lawyer anyway? Because we don't actually define one here, do we? We define activities which are reserved to members of accredited professions. But, you know, I can say I'm a lawyer. 
Absolutely not. Never practiced in my life. Divorced my cleaning lady once. Um, <laughs> found it quite difficult. <laughs> Well, I think that's a lovely optimistic note uh, to end on. So thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you.